Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Optimizing Therapy for Patients with Hormone Receptor Positive Metastatic Breast Cancer, harboring PIK3, AKT, and P or P10 pathway alterations. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Kamal Javeri from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, and Dr. Hope Rugo from the University of California at San Francisco in San Francisco. Today, it's really amazing. We can, we're going to have been barely enough time to get through this small part of breast cancer, but there's so much going on now. We'll see even more at San Antonio. We're really looking forward to that. In addition to our two faculty, we also have uh, 19 other investigators. You'll recognize most of these uh, uh, docs who participated in a patterns of care survey, including our faculty. We'll show you some of the results of that uh, later on in the meeting. As is the case all the time when we do uh, webinars, we will be discussing the use of non-approved agents and regimens, so check out the package insert for more uh, specific information. Here's where we're going to head here today. We're going to start out talking a little bit about pathways and biology, and then we'll jump into clinical data. Actually, uh, we recorded a presentation by Hope that uh, right now is in the chat room if you want to click on it. When we distribute uh, this webinar, we'll include that presentation. That's a great presentation with lots of very interesting slides. Today we're really here to chat, but if you want to take a look at some of the data more specifically, uh, check out uh, Hope's presentation and her slides. Uh, so we're going to go through some of the data and these two uh, key questions that we're going to talk about today. First-line therapy, where now we have an interesting option targeting these pathways, as you all know, and then uh, the options in terms of recurrent disease. Then we'll show you some of the uh, results of the survey we did, and then we'll finish out with some cases uh, from the faculty. So here are a few of the slides from Hope's presentation. We're not going to ask her or Kamal to go through them in detail, but what I really want to do is sort of take a step back, Kamal, and uh, have you imagine you're walking down the hall making rounds with you know, fellows, for example, and you don't have slides or a chalkboard to talk about, you want to try to explain to them the pathways involved. So maybe you can begin this kind of brief conversation uh, about sort of what these alterations are and where they fit in and what's your vision uh, for the biology of uh, endocrine resistance that we're encountering clinically. Yeah, no, thank you. That's such a great question. And I think the way I think about this is, and then what I tell my fellows or would tell my fellows, is that endocrine therapy really is a very effective strategy, and that's a backbone of our therapy for patients with ER-positive breast cancer. And the problem is it's not that it's not an effective strategy. It is an effective strategy, but it stops working for patients. And these patients then develop, or these tumors become endocrine-resistant. And we try to identify what are the different ways these tumors are becoming endocrine-resistant. And So one pathway is it remains dependent on the ER, but it develops a mutation in the estrogen receptor itself, which we call as ESR1 mutations, we now have a oral SIRD LSS strand that's already approved in that setting. But another way this tumors become endocrine resistance, resistant is by you know, having these gr growth factor-like pathways that become very activated. And one such pathway is the pi 3 k akt mTOR pathway. And really this pathway can be activated by various ways and many different mechanisms, but the most prevalent of them is the mutation in the PIK3CA gene itself. And that gene is mutated in approximately 40% of hormone receptor positive breast cancers. Additionally, there are other alterations that we have also found that can activate this pathway, including AKT mutations and P10 mutations or P10 loss. These AKT mutations and P10 mutations can be approximately 5 to 10% in prevalence as well. So I would say approximately half of ER positive tumors. So ER positive is 70% of breast cancer. 50% of which can harbor mutations in the PI3K AKT mTOR pathway, which is a very valid, validated mechanism of endocrine resistance. And fortunately, now we have therapies that can be targeted to this pathway. We have agents specifically targeting various different nodes of these pathway, maybe upstream PI3K, maybe AKT, which is a central node, or downstream nodes such as mTOR that we have been able to offer our patients in combination with endocrine therapy. 
Hope, can you uh, add to that excellent description and also get a little bit into the type of assays, but particularly the timing of whether you see this uh, at, at, you know, at first diagnosis when the patient gets breast cancer or later, whether it's clonal or acquired? That's such a great question because we've learned so much about the sort of fleeting nature of ESR1 mutations that are acquired under the pressure of treatment. We've learned, for example, that even... <laughs> markers we held true, like ER, are like ever disappearing under our current therapy, which is kind of surprising. And I think, you know, something new under the pressure of treatment, just like, you know, the longer you give endocrine therapy, the more likely and the more lines, the more likely you are to develop an ESR1 mutation. And when you treat, you the ESR1 mutation goes away. In striking contrast, alterations in uh, the PI3 kinase pathway, so PIK3CA mutations and AKT mutations, I don't know that we know as much about P10 loss, but likely uh, they seem to be conserved. So they're clonal. They start out at the beginning. So you can actually see these mutations in early stage untreated cancers. There is some acquisition of those uh, alterations that we've seen in the, we started looking at it really in the CDK4-6 inhibitor trials where patients were tested at the beginning and some patients had tumor at the end. And you could see an acquisition rate, we don't know for sure, but looks like it's under 10% uh, that acquire alterations in that pathway. So unlike, for example, looking for ESR1, you could use an archival tumor sample uh, and it would be uh, at least mostly accurate. It's not perfect. I mean, having tissue is a good idea if you don't see the mutation, but you might as well screen with ctDNA. And then, you know, I think that what's important also is because we're also looking at P10, this loss of the tumor suppressor gene. P10 is the one thing that you can't see as well in ctDNA because you can have large deletions like BRCA, or I guess it's mostly, you know, I guess it's BRCA1 or 2, where you can see large deletions. You won't pick that up in ctDNA, just to keep in mind. So uh, let's move on now and talk a little bit about some of the specific data related to the scenarios. We're going to start out talking about first-line therapy, and inhibition of these pathways has been in, in more in the second line or restricted to second line until recently. We did a program last uh, Saturday with a Florida cancer specialist, and we included a module on breast cancer. We had uh, Seth Wander from MGH and uh, Joyce O'Shaughnessy. And, of course, we were talking about uh, this approval that just came through three weeks ago. I was joking that oncologists wake up in the morning, they check their phone to see what's approved, and then they start figuring out who in their practice it applies to. And it's going to apply to a lot of people because now we're talking about Kamal first-line therapy uh, that was uh, just approved also uh, with a, a companion uh, liquid uh, CDX assay from uh, Foundation One. Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about what we know about Inovalisib, uh, Kamal. Uh, you know, obviously we have had Alpalisib out there. What's, how is Inovalisib different? Yeah, no, I think, you know, what is common between the two is that we think that they are alpha isoform specific BI3K inhibitors. But when we then look at you know, very closely in the preclinical data sets that we have for both agents available, we we have understood that enavolizib has a higher potency and selectivity for the PIK3 alpha isoform compared to alpalizib. So essentially, when we look at the four isoforms of the P110 catalytic subunit, alpha, beta, delta, gamma, enavolizib is much more potent at inhibiting the alpha isoform, which is relevant because the toxicity profiles potentially could be dependent on that. Additionally, we also think that based on the preclinical data that we have is that it also causes degradation of the mutant P110 alpha. And that potentially degradation, which results in a prolonged pathway suppression, could potentially make it more uh, appealing in terms of the toxicity profile or what we are able to achieve in clinic. At least preclinically, that's what we saw when we compared alpelacid, which is already approved, and now venavalacid, both going after the alpha isoform or being labeled as alpha isoform specific inhibitors. So a quick follow-up, uh, Nicholas in the chat room, uh, Kamal wants you to comment on the difference between P10 loss and the FDA designation of alterations in the gene. Yeah. So the P10 loss, as Hope was trying to also highlight, I think it can be tricky. I think one point that I'll make is that we don't necessarily understand how much of AKT and P10 can be acquired uh, 
as a mechanism of resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors. We know that pic 3 ca mutations predominantly are truncal alterations. So whether you test them in the tissue, whether it's primary tissue, whether it's metastatic tissue, they are truncal, they are clonal, and so you should be able to identify them. The acquired alterations of pic 3 are smaller, and those, actually, we don't know if they respond to the uh, uh, PI3K alpha inhibitors the same way we have seen with tissue. P10, while we have been able to see that they can be uh, present in the tissue, they could be potentially a mechanism of resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors. I think a little bit more research is still needed to better understand whether we will see a lot more of acquired P10 alterations and AKT post-CDK4-6 inhibitors, or we just see the same prevalence between primary and tissue. But if you don't detect it in the plasma, the P10 uh, uh, alteration, you have to look for the tissue. And P10 loss, we don't know, is necessarily a true biomarker yet. There is some data that will be presented at the San Antonio meeting from the Capitello 291 study, which will look into P10 loss by immunohistochemistry and P10 alterations by NGS. But right now, when we're referring to alterations, we are talking only about mutations that can be detected by an NGS in the tissue. So uh, before we got started here, the three of us were talking about what's going to be happening at San Antonio, and we'll be doing, a, as I mentioned, another CME program. And I hope I remember last year at San Antonio, uh, when we sat down to do a CME program, uh, you were there, and uh, Dr. Kaklamani, who was the uh, head of the uh, San Antonio meeting, and I heard this wild story about how this trial managed to get presented at San Antonio, where the press release came out on Tuesday, and Dr. Kaklamani looked at this and says, we can't wait till ASCO to get this out. We got to figure out a way to present it two days later or three days later, and they actually pulled it off. I think it was the world record for going from press release to actually having it be presented. But thankfully, you know, we could, now we have the, the drug approved, and Maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, the, how this, the, the study design and what the rationale was for how it was designed, Hope. Well, you know, it's a fascinating trial. And of course, Komal presented the data at uh, San Antonio. And I was very fortunate because I was somehow involved in those initial discussions, you know, the yeah. initial text. And, uh, and I just happened to know the right person. And uh, it, it uh, was, so that was, I think, on Tuesday. And we, I gave the discussion and Como gave a beautiful presentation on Friday. So it was crazy. We didn't, I didn't even see the slides until Wednesday afternoon. So <laughs> it was pretty, uh, pretty crazy time. Not a lot of sleep, but, uh, the study I think was very nicely designed. I think it's important to keep in mind, uh, about why did they do this study? So this wasn't just like, Oh, we have another PI3 kinase inhibitor. We want to, you know, compare it to the others. There, that's That trial does exist, and we'll hear about it next year maybe. But this was a different approach. There was really strong preclinical data that showed that if you gave a triplet where you blocked the P3 kinase pathway and it gave a CDK4-6 inhibitor with endocrine therapy in uh, PIK3CA altered tumors, that you could delay the development of resistance and perhaps overcome resistance in tumors that had already developed progression on the doublet approach. So this was actually really nice data by a number of investigators. So it was studied with alpelosib, intolerable to give alpelosib and uh, ribo together with endocrine therapy. And then it was studied in the Trinity trial with low-dose everolimus. We thought that actually was a really good trial, but everolimus was already generic and there were a lot of competitors. So this trial wanted to look at the same population and it looked at a unique population. These are patients who have primary or secondary endocrine resistance. They either relapse on or within 12 months of adjuvant endocrine therapy completion, but the trial didn't care what endocrine therapy they'd gotten. They just couldn't have had full vestrant. No prior therapy for advanced breast cancer um, and then Inavo has been studied in a population of patients who do not have bad glucose. And this study, like the others, looked at patients who had essentially a normal hemoglobin A1C and a normal fasting glucose. So they didn't want to deal with a lot of bad glucose problems. You had to have a PIK3CA mutation. It could be by local tissue, central, or ctDNA, local, or central. Uh, patients had measurable disease. They received Inavo versus placebo with palbo and fulvestrant, 325 patients with a primary endpoint of progression-free survival by the investigator, which I think is also important. And interestingly, you know, they had the stratification factors listed, uh, which I think are important looking at primary versus secondary and visceral disease or not. 
Uh, but the last patient was enrolled in this trial at the end of September 2023, and they had data at the end of November. That in and of itself, without seeing any press release, tells you that you have a very potent treatment, which is fascinating, right? These trials where we're waiting and waiting in the metastatic setting, it's not a good sign. Early stage, a little bit different. But um, I so this is in some ways, a really cool study, right? You have a study based on very robust preclinical data with a novel and potent uh, drug that targets the PI3 kinase pathway. I think in many ways, it's a really cool study. So, Jabal, can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the data that you presented there in San Antonio? And again, Hope's presentation goes into much more detail, but what's sort of the bottom line of what was seen there in this trial? Yeah, no, I think Hope, Hope really summarized the study population really, really well. So really that poor prognostic patient population with measurable disease, you know, majority, half of these patients uh, were premenopausal women. And, and we think that sometimes that that is a, a patient population, perhaps with an aggressive biology. But more importantly, these were patients with visceral metastases, 50% with liver metastases that, that was present. As Hope said, these were endocrine resistant patients, a third being primary endocrine resistant two-thirds being secondary endocrine resistant, and majority of these patients were detected to have the PIK3CA alteration using circulating tumor DNA. So that just highlights that this is enough disease burden that's filling in the plasma that is detected by ctDNA, and this was not this was the majority of our patients. And what we saw was that in the control arm with fulvestrin pulps, palvociclib, in patients who've had no treatment for their metastatic disease, the progression fee survival, the median progression fee survival was seven months. It was 7.3 months. And that nearly doubled with the addition of anovalacid to palvociclib and fulvestrin to 15 months with a hazard ratio of 0.43, which was statistically significant. In fact, when we look at the, the landmark analyses at a median follow-up of 21 months, which is when we uh, did this readout, we see that even at the 18-month time point, when we're looking at uh, these patients on the control arm and in the treatment arm, there were more than double the patients uh, progression-free in the treatment arm. So 46% in the inavolusive arm compared to 21% in the control arm. So I hope this is another slide uh, you talked about in your uh, presentation, uh, noting uh, that the survival is, at this earlier point is, uh, I guess, not statistically significant, but certainly very encouraging safety data looked kind of much better than what we're used to seeing, I think, with Alpalisib. I'm not sure how much that had to do with the entry criteria. And in fact, we had a question in the chat room about how many patients fit into this criteria. Should they actually, in terms of a glucose intolerance, and should they actually be following that? Or can they squeeze in? Maybe some people aren't, uh, maybe quite fit those criteria. Any comments about any of these things, Hope? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, these additional endpoints are really encouraging. I'll point out that on the left-hand side where you look at PFS investigator assessed in subgroups that you see this very prominent uh, hazard ratio for the patients who got tamoxifen, and that represented a little under 50% of the population, kind of unique. But if you look at the AI only, that confidence interval also doesn't cross one. So I think that the data holds regardless, but there was about half of the population who had received only adjuvant tamoxifen. The overall response and, of course, duration of response is quite remarkable. And I think, you know, if you see a median of 9.6 or 18, I mean, it's incredible, has a ratio of 0.57. And that overall survival is intriguing. You know, we have to wait, but this seeing that kind of early difference in number of events is encouraging. We looked at safety as interesting. I mean, I have given a fair bit of a Novo, not on a Novo 120, but in the second line setting with an oral surd. Uh, and the, you know, it, the drug is pretty well tolerated, but the patients on that second line trial could not have had, you know, pre diabetes or diabetes. And so, we do see hyperglycemia. It's mild in those patients. All of my patients were on metformin or glucophage. So. I think that this, these drugs, it's a pathway effect. You will see hyperglycemia. If you give it to a population of patients in the U.S., a third of patients in the U.S. have glucose intolerance. And then there are the patients who obviously have diabetes. So you do have to monitor these patients closely. I don't think you're going to all of a sudden see hyperglycemia at five months. When you have to monitor them closely is in the first two months of treatment and in the first couple of weeks to know that they're not going up. And you have to talk to them about diet, et cetera. 
what are the main differences between this and some of the other agents that we studied? The rate of rash for an enovolacip is quite low, which is nice. Um, you do see some diarrhea and a low rate of grade three diarrhea. I um, I suspect that the hyperglycemia from enovolacib will be easier to control. There is a trial that will open this year that will look at Safina, that will look at patients who have true diabetes, but not type 1, type 2 diabetes, to look at how what's the best management strategy for giving enovolacib to patients on meds. And that's going to be hugely helpful for us. Of course, this is now in the area era of GLP to agonists, you know, and so now everybody can take, you know, drugs that control your glucose. And I do have patients who are on, for example, everolimus with type two diabetes, where they get hyperglycemia, who are on these drugs, and it makes a huge difference. I mean, it's like the nightmare of the past is much, much better now because we're more able to control hyperglycemia. You can see that the treatment discontinuation in this population, although carefully selected, was under seven percent. That compared to about 23 to 25% for alpelacib. So um, certainly very encouraging. I'll just add, Neil, that I've had patients on phase one trial with this triplet that we initially were enrolling who've been on this therapy for a very, very long time. Some patients even beyond the five-year mark at this point that we have and who are tolerating treatment well. So even in terms of long-term management, that has not been an issue. And I, I agree with Hope's comment that I feel like, yes, you'll see hypoglycemia, but it's slightly easier to manage. And hopefully with all these agents that we have available, maybe we can optimize management strategies better. So uh, back to Kamal with a couple of questions from the many questions we're getting in, uh, in the chat room. Uh, from Danny, quote, we rarely use Palvo in younger patients nowadays. Uh, any thoughts about the choice of CDK? And a really interesting question, what about patients who recur on or soon after adjuvant CDK, abema or ribo? When the study was designed, this was designed when Palvo was the choice uh, of, uh, of the investigators and, you know, the community was utilizing Palvociclib a lot more. So it, it just was a choice because that's what our practice reflected. Um, there is certainly an ongoing study, the Morpheus trial, which is evaluating enavolacib with ribociclib and abemaciclib combinations as well. So we will soon have those data available as well. And I think importantly, you know, this is a randomized study. Obviously, we've looked at full western palvo with full western palvo and enavolacib. And one, one would wonder, and I think that's an interesting scientific question, what is really the contribution of an individual drug in a triplet regimen, right? Would the delta of benefit between one CDK4-6 inhibitor versus another CDK4-6 inhibitor be really, really significant in a triplet regimen? Because we're looking at benefit with the triplet itself and preclinical data suggested the synergy with all three. So I think it's a great question. I think we'll have at least safety data and efficacy data from phase one trials for the other CDK4-6. Your second question was about the adjuvant CDK4-6. Again, a right. fantastic question. When this trial was designed, that was not an issue that we were facing in clinical. That was not an issue we would have encountered for our patients that got enrolled. And so understandably, we only had four patients who had uh, had a adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor who were enrolled on this trial. So I think this is a very important research question, a scientific question that we now want to address, that how is genomic profiling and, and detection of these alterations for patients who really progress on an adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor will, will impact with a triplet regimen or maybe a chemotherapy or an antibody drug conjugate. So something that we really have to study. We don't have that uh, data today to address that question definitively. I will say, you know, one thing, so, just to just squeeze in one little small thing there, that Palvo, you know, I think Palvo plays well in the sandbox. So I would discourage substituting a CDK4-6 inhibitor in this setting until we have that safety data uh, presented in a public forum and we know what's going on. And, you know, in the mice anyway, if you added the PA3 kinase inhibitor to the combination, it, it seemed to help. <laughs> It's really so, well tolerated uh, CDK4-6 as well. So I think that comes in handy in triplet regimens because it's one of the easier tolerated CDK4-6 inhibitors. This is one of these webinars that I really should just introduce the two of you and just go <laughs> have a cup of coffee and let the two of you talk. But anyhow, let's uh, move on now, talk about recurrent disease. I know love, people love to hear both of you speak. So Kamal, again, can you just ch chat a little bit again without kind of getting into the, this, all the details in the slides, but your vision about how capivacertib works? Yeah, so capivacertib is really an AKT inhibitor. It inhibits all three isoforms of AKT 
which is AKT 1 to 3. So AKT, we know, is a central node of the PI3K AKT mTOR pathway. And again, I think what we're trying to see is that obviously it gets its, you know, a feed from upstream of the node, but maybe other ways of also activating that pathway. And we had prior AKT inhibitors, the allosteric inhibitors, which were very toxic, and we did not necessarily uh, see any uh, efficacy because of that toxicity issue. But with capivacertib, uh, we've been able to see it's an ATP competitive inhibitor of the AKT isoforms. And I think this is a, one of the very important ways of also trying to target this pathway. So Hope, I love this graphic uh, that you used in your presentation. I don't know if you want to add to that, but also a little bit about what we uh, knew about it in terms of mechanism of action before it actually went into clinical trials. Yeah, well, we knew that, you know, Capivacertib is a really interesting agent because it was developed uh, by our colleagues in the UK and the phase one study was kind of like, you know, before we had all these FDA mandates of looking at different doses and schedules, they were already looking at different doses and schedules and they looked at uh, giving the drug continuously, but they saw some toxicity and then they gave it, you know, four on, three off, but they saw maintenance of suppression and less toxicity. So that's actually what ended up leading to the current dosing schedule for a capivacertib. But what they did see was this dose-dependent inhibition of cellular AKT with increasing concentrations and a really interesting <laughs> synergy, both with hormone therapy and here with chemotherapy, although you know, we've been really challenged in trying to use this combination in triple negative disease, mainly because I think we're studying people who have very resistant, chemotherapy resistant disease. So you can't overcome that. You know, we need to move it to maybe the early stage setting. But I think, you know, the data we know, very potent inhibitor and uh, seem to, the dose that we give now uh, keeps uh, phospho AKT inhibited. So let's talk about the study that led to the approval uh, of the Capitella 291, uh, Kamal, can you uh, kind of summarize the, the rationale behind this design and what they actually did? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this study was actually born out of, you know, the enthusiasm we saw in the phase two Factian trial that preceded this study. And in the Factian trial, we saw doubling of PFS uh, for uh, full Western capivacertib compared to full Western. And then initially we had seen that, you know, the responses were you know, probably seen uh, in, in pathway altered patients or, or in all comer patients, but potentially, but the deeper uh, look at the uh, correlative suggested that it was restricted to the pathway altered patients when it came to both PFS and OS. So the Capitola 291, we wanted to address two things. In fact, and everybody was CDK46 naive. So do we see the same kind of activity or do we still see activity for this combination post CDK46? That was one question. And the second question was, do we see the activity only in pathway altered patients or do we see that in all comers? So essentially this phase three registrational study enrolled patients, men and uh, women, both regardless of menopausal status. These patients were not allowed more than two lines of endocrine therapy. They were not allowed more than one line of chemotherapy, no prior CERD, no prior PI3K, AKT or mTOR agent. The hemoglobin A1C cutoff is rather liberal here, less than 8%. And these patients were then randomized to capivacertib at this intermittent dose. Again, this is the only uh, drug targeting this pathway utilizing an intermittent dosing schedule, 400 milligrams twice daily, four days on, three days off, in combination with fulvestrin compared to fulvestrin placebo with dual primary endpoints. So one was looking at progression-free survival in all patients, so intent to treat. But the second one was for looking at PFS in the AKT pathway altered patients. So any patient whose tumor harbors any mutation, one or more, in the PIK3CA, AKT, or P10 is what they focused their PFS as a dual secondary endpoint as well. 70% of these patients had had CDK. So Hope, do you want to comment on what was seen? Absolutely. So... I think this population of patients, you know, represents a more real, real world population. A little under 20% had had prior chemotherapy. And I think that's important because we've seen that, you know, in the second line CDK46 inhibitor, second and third line CDK46 inhibitor trials, only Paloma 3 allowed patients who'd had prior chemotherapy. And those patients definitely did worse. I mean, you know, you generate a lot of resistance with chemotherapy. So I think it's encouraging that that group of patients was included, and it really, uh, I think, um, 
gives us a message that we should be using sequential endocrine therapy with targeted agents and not using chemotherapy until we have to. But here, what we saw in this mixed patient population was that capivacertib improved progression-free survival by a statistically significant difference. And you can see that this goes, maybe you can see it, but 3.6 to 7.2 months. And, you know, the hazard ratio is very good and met, uh, way over met the criteria required for, uh, for positive, um, result. And then the definition of AKT altered population is on the right-hand side of that uh, slide where uh, what you could see was when you took out, remember that in this study, 40% of patients had alterations of the AKT pathway defined as PIK3CA mutations, AKT mutations, or P10 alterations, and about 30% were PIK3CA and 5% each of the others. But when you looked at the group of patients who had this pathway alteration, uh, what you saw was an even better hazard ratio. Uh, the differences were relatively similar. The hazard ratio decreased. And so that's really what led the FDA to approve the drug combination in patients who have pathway altered uh, disease. Now, you know, 16 or so percent of patients had unknown alterations and that, you know, they haven't been able to look at CTDNA because of the difficulty looking at P10 in the uh, blood, but maybe we'll see that next year. We also saw improvement in progression in uh, response rates, which was encouraging and early evidence of a uh, difference in overall survival. And hopefully we'll see that data next year as well. At ESMO Breast this year, we looked at PFS2, so what happens after you have progression on the initial therapy and does, you know, you're in the second line setting. So in some ways, this really makes a very big difference in terms of understanding subsequent effects. If you looked at the overall population and the altered population, you can see that the PFS difference is maintained with very nice hazard ratios, similar to the initial hazard ratios. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, a lot of patients received chemotherapy, almost half as their next treatment, but this was regardless of treatment overall. And this, of course, is nice data to see. So I got to say, I'm seeing a lot of new faces in the chat room I haven't seen before. I want to say hi to all the new people who are coming in here. I guess I'm uh, drawn in by you two as well as the topic. <laughs> we talked a little bit about the uh, issue of tolerability. Uh, Kamal, anything you want to add to what we've already said, both on your clinical experience and the data? Also, any issues with adherence to this unusual schedule, of, you know, not taking it for several days? Yeah, no, I think uh, excellent questions. So I think in terms of, you know, toxicities that we see with capivacertib particularly and what was reported out in the Capitola 291, I think the two most common toxicities that we encounter with our patients in clinic are diarrhea and rash. And diarrhea, all grade, you know, 70% of these patients approximately had all grade diarrhea and approximately 9% had grade three diarrhea, which is more than seven episodes of diarrhea a day. When we looked at gra rash as a group term, so any kind of rash and the way they described and captured it, approximately 38% had some kind of rash. And of these, 12% had grade three rash. So what was not um, included in the study was, you know, using prophylactic antihistamines or any prophylactic measures to encounter this rash, which is what something that we now use in clinic. And we do that routinely with alpelacid which is our alpha-specific PITK inhibitor. But I think based on this toxicity profile, I've started using that for capivacertib as well. And in contrast to what we've seen otherwise, hyperglycemia rates with capivacertib were 16% all grade and grade three hyperglycemia rates were 2%. This was despite the hemoglobin A1C cutoff of uh, less than 8%, which was uh, what we had used as a cutoff for patients to be eligible for this clinical trial. So certainly not a big signal of hyperglycemia with AKT inhibitors, specifically capivacertib. Some uh, evidence of stomatitis, as you would expect with this class of agents, 14% all grade, but nothing really uh, uh, remarkable uh, with respect to that as a toxicity. So I would say diarrhea and rash, and I think in my strategy for managing these patients in clinic, uh, I have been utilizing or I have been thinking about utilizing antihistamines uh, just so that I can potentially uh, avoid the severity of the grade of rash, uh, especially the grade three rash that we did see in the Capitello 291 trial. And I think we'll see in our survey that you're not the only person using this strategy. And the NCCN has blessed us with category uh, one uh, support as the preferred or subsequent line therapy in patients in select patients that we've talked about which ones. What about the phase three Capitella 292 study, I uh, hope? 
Well, so this is an ongoing trial. We initially did a uh, phase sort of 1B slash 2 trial looking at combinations to see which CDK4-6 inhibitor we could combine with Capi and Fulvestrant, and both palbociclib and ribociclib can be safely used in this triplet combination. So this is a trial that's quite similar to ANOVA 120 with one big exception. So these are patients who they know more than one line of prior chemotherapy for advanced disease, so they could have received one chemotherapy. They can't have, of course, received any drugs that target the pathway, but the similarity is disease relapse while on or within 12 months at the end of therapy, so primary or secondary endocrine resistance. The other area that's different is that they're not required to have an alteration of the pathway because we did see this benefit in the intent to treat population overall. Um, so you don't, you know, they'll of course be looking at that and it's part of the stratification, but it's not uh, part of the uh, eligibility. So we started out with palbo, we now have ribo, so we can use uh, either one of those CDK4-6 inhibitors in the triplet combination and patients are randomized to the triplet or doublet with fulvestrant, very similar to what ANOVA 120 did with a primary endpoint of centrally confirmed progression-free survival. So I want to take a look at some of the survey uh, issues that we got into uh, here. Uh, Kamal, first in terms of uh, strategy, and you know, each one of these represents one of these investigators, again, including our faculty. Uh, can you talk about your preferred strategy uh, for uh, PIC3, AKTP10 mutation testing, liquid tissue or both? Yeah, so I think it's a great question. I think, you know, when I think about a newly diagnosed metastatic patient, because we tend to confirm the diagnosis of metastatic disease and have tissue available, at our institution, we've been using NGS from that tissue itself at the time of diagnosis of metastatic disease for a very long time now. And I think with, with trials such as Inava 120 and drugs such as Inava Less approved, I think this, this has become probably more, more and more important. And I think it's really important for clonal and truncal alterations like PI3K because, as we discussed, they don't really change, right? Whether you look at primary tissue or metastatic tissue. So you have this ease of tissue available for diagnosis of metastatic disease and you can send NGS and you can get that data available. When we think about ESR1 mutations, we're thinking about liquid biopsies. And I think about that when patients have progression on their first line therapy. So when they have progression either as standard of care with CDK4-6 inhibitors and endocrine therapy, I'm doing a liquid biopsy, which will help me to detect this PIC3 alterations, AKT alterations, P10 mutations as well, but certainly give me these subclonal ESR1 mutations as well and help me understand what should I be offering at, uh, at time of progression for these patients. So my strategy has been doing tissue up front at least because it's easy, and then liquid biopsy, which I've, I've done sometimes serially in a patient. Certainly I would repeat tissue uh, testing again when I'm trying to repeat a biopsy if I'm looking for change in HER2 status, I'm looking for HER2 low disease, or if a patient has an unusual response, meaning they started on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, they had an unusual response, and I'm, I'm thinking whether there's a change in biomarker that I need to probably go after, and I'm repeating biopsies, that's when I would test it again. So we've uh, learned when we do surveys, we have to do them as quickly, as soon as, you know, early as close as possible to the webinar, because who knows there's going to be an approval. And, you know, as we sent this thing out, you know, the thing was, the triplet was getting approved. So uh, anything you want to add to what um, Kamal just said? And also, uh, Hope, uh, in terms of when you test, you know, everybody says in the first line, or most people are now are saying in the first line metastatic setting, uh, you know, I guess particularly in er, in early re, uh, relapse or endocrine resistant cases. Hope, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that the testing is interesting because there are the acquired mutations, and blood is pretty good for ESR one. Um, so you can look in blood with progression, you know. And I think we all have a good, pretty good idea when people are starting to progress, and then I'll send it in advance. But you know, one of the difficulties we get into is these patients who have bone only disease; they don't have any variant allele fractions, so there's no ccDNA. You know, it's so little you can't find the mutations. And I've run into that recently in a few patients, even sometimes after the second line progression, a very endocrine sensitive disease. Uh, but 
the biopsies are important, and I think we want to do a biopsy, if at all possible, to document metastatic disease because, you know, we've all seen a patient who we thought had metastatic breast cancer and it was lung primary or something, you know. Um, the other thing is that we've seen more loss of ER over time. So looking, uh, you know, HER2 is important, but ER loss, I think, is a really important driver. There are patients, you know, where de novo metastatic disease, you know, breast primary, ER 90%, first progression in liver, ER negative <laughs> everywhere and retested. So I do think we do want to keep in mind that this is an important way of assessing ER. And then to keep in mind also that you could miss things like these big deletions in blood. So you want to have a tissue at some point knowing that pic 3 c is conserved. Um, and you want to, and also you know, you want to be able to look at blood over time. I mean, there are other things we're targeting, like, you know, HER2 and uh, uh, BRCA somatic mutations that seem to be acquired to some degree. We don't know it well, but there there's definitely acquisition over time. So, Kamal, uh, we call these graphics where we take 20 or 25 investigators beyond the guidelines because, because guidelines with the NCSEN often offer a number of evidence-based options and we just like to say, what do you do in this situation outside a clinical trial? The same thing everybody asks you. If everybody says the same thing. We call it a consensus. Here's an early relapsing patient nine months into adjuvant and astrazole. We're pretty much at a consensus that the triplet is here. Anything you want to comment on in terms of that, Kamal? And also, how much can you stretch that, uh, de you know, the definition of uh, early relapsing? Yeah, no, I think, uh, again, fantastic questions. I think the population that we studied, at least in the ANAVA 120, was this endocrine resistant. And the, the, the definition of that endocrine resistance is really what we followed with from the ESMO guidelines, where we think about, you know, primary endocrine resistant tumors. And one of the ways we talk about primary endocrine resistant tumor is those that uh, progress within the first 24 months of their adjuvant endocrine therapy. And secondary endocrine resistance is after the 24 months of their adjuvant endocrine therapy. In the metastatic setting, we think about them as those progressing in the first six months of their first line therapy or beyond the six-month time point. But that was also, again, not during the CDK4-6 inhibitor days. So I think at least in the ENAVA 120, we use those guidelines to look at this endocrine-resistant patients, and that's why we focused on the group that recurred on or within 12 months of their adjuvant endocrine therapy. So certainly this patient falls in that category if I had a patient who progressed, say, on 13 months or 14 months, would I not want to apply this data? I think I would. I would still apply that data, even in that setting, because how truly different is a 13 or a 14-month disease-free interval uh, from a 12-month? But I think this just provides us some guidance as to what kind of patient population is what this trial enrolled and where should we actually really apply evidence-based uh, you know, approaches and recommendations for our patients that we offer these triplet strategies for. So Hope, uh, one of these posters that was accepted was actually one we worked on with Kamal. We actually showed uh, micro learning videos to docs and a third of them changed what they did after they watched these. But in any event, one of the most interesting and controversial things we were asking second line at that time, now we're you know, bringing up the issue of first line, was what about the doubly mutated patient? In the second line, we did not see a consensus. We have like a 50-50 and, you know, people kind of look at what the case is. I guess this is really not exactly relevant right now today because we don't have SIRDs approved in this setting. But anything you want to say about these doubly mutated patients in general or this question, Hope? I think you do actually can give LSSTRINT in this setting because the patient has developed resistance to anastrozole in the adjuvant setting. But I think the unique aspect of this particular patient where you know, you really have to be thinking about patients who share these mutations is you have to characterize it based on the burden of disease and the pattern of disease progression. So the biology here, this is a patient who had a little cancer, node negative, ER positive, multiple METs nine months after studying adjuvant and astrozole. So we're thinking this patient has primary endocrine resistance. So I don't think anybody would be too excited about giving this patient a single agent oral CERT because of the evidence of primary endocrine resistance. Here, we really have an opportunity to potentially use endocrine therapy in a more effective way, capitalizing on what we know about the uh, PIK3CA mutation. So the triplet would be the winner here, certainly for me. And that's how we think about these patients. If you have a patient who has a Pietrokinase mutation, you know, who's 
you know, done really well and relapses 10 years after their diagnosis, you know, this is a really different population of patients. And that's why I think our decisions about when we're going to be testing and using a triplet need to be driven by the trial population and the data we have right now. So actually, Karen Green in the chat room. Hey, Karen, good to see you. And she's a doc very involved with breast cancer and also brings up the fact that the F FDA approvals less restrictive than the NAVO eligibility that we we're just talking about. But another interesting question, I think that came up, uh, Kamal, from Daniel, if the liquid biopsy is negative and you can't access metastatic site on biopsy, you know, maybe a bone, et cetera, can you rely on PIK3 HATP10 from the historical primary tumor biopsy? Yeah, so I think the answer is yes. PIK3CA, as we were discussing, are clonal mutations or truncal mutations. And certainly they would be reliable whether you test them in the primary tissue or in the metastatic tissue. For P10, if you don't see P10 and if you were just not able to get any alterations in the liquid, I think tissue is still your gold standard. And I think you could still go back and do a biopsy in the metastatic setting and ensure that there's no other alterations that you could actually go and target because we do have even Capivacertib approved for AKTP10 altered patients. So I think it would be an important one to remember. So uh, we talked earlier about uh, tolerability issues with inovalisib, and you can see that this fa the faculty, or the, the response on the survey kind of brought up the same issues that we uh, got into uh, originally. I guess cytopenia is probably more related to the palbo, I would think, but you know, maybe a little bit more there. But let's get into uh, the second line setting, and here we have a situation of a patient who gets a CDK inhibitor and AI first line, relapses 18 months uh, later, so more endocrine sensitive, but with a PIK3 positive uh, assay. And it was amazing how quickly we saw these answers change when Capivacertib came in. People were ready to you know, jump on it because they were having so many difficulties with Alpalisib. Any comments, Hope? Yeah, I think that, you know, we, <laughs> We aren't diabetologists, and it can be hard for us to get our patients in to see the endocrinologist and have them be managed in some ways as tightly as they might need to be managed on alpelisib. So they're used to not doing quite that much tight, you know, management in a patient with metastatic disease. But then we end up seeing all this hyperglycemia. And it was associated also with weight loss, the sort of chronic weight loss we see, um, and which I haven't seen with Cappy. And then diarrhea, you know, a lot of people got chronic diarrhea. Well, so then you're going to give them glucophage. They're going to get diarrhea and nausea. And then, you know, do you give them these new drugs that we monitor? I mean, most of us aren't giving, prescribing those drugs, uh, the agonists. And, you know, we hate starting insulin. I mean, oncologists hate starting insulin. So we want to work with endocrinologists. So I think that that was a big drive to use a drug that doesn't cause the same degree. CAPI can cause hyperglycemia too. It's just a minor, tiny minority of patients who really need uh, you know, more proactive management who didn't have hyperglycemia when they started on treatment. And I think that the rash issue is not to be uh, put aside. There is a rash with CAPI, but it's little. The rash with alpelisib was big, and even though we gave the non-sedating uh, antihistamines, I still had a couple of patients who had grade 3 rash and could not continue drug. I've seen it with Everolimus, too. I mean, we're going to see it. But it seems to be much less with Capi and less with Inovolisib. So uh, we've talked about AKT1 and P10 mutations. This is what I call our consensus. Everybody <laughs> says Cappy and uh, full vestrant. Uh, uh, before we get into this next one, a couple of quick questions from the chat room. Uh, uh, Kamal, uh, Karen wants to know what you mean by, quote, a truncal mutation. And Shaba wants to know, what about if the patient recurs like within six months? Are you still going on with endocrine therapy? Yeah, no, I think that, uh, again, both excellent questions. So, Karen, what I was trying to say is that certain alterations or mutations are something that you would see that drive the biology and can be present throughout the journey, whether you test a tumor, which is a primary tumor, or whether you test multiple times or different time points throughout the metastatic journey. So if you had two or three different kinds of metastatic tissue or you had a primary tumor, if there is a PIK3C alteration, which is present in 40% of ER positive patients, you can capture that at any time point for that given patient. So a clonal mutation is what is driving that tumor, and you can capture that any time during the treatment journey. This is in contrast to ESR1 mutations that occur under the selective pressure of therapies. So aromatase inhibitors is why 
these mutations occur. That's why we call them subclonal. And that's why if you biopsy only one site, you can miss it because you could have in one patient three or four different sites of metastatic disease, one that might harbor a ESR1 mutation, other that does not. But if you do a ctDNA, because it's going to be spilling in the blood, you will still be able to capture that mutation regardless of where it's, which site it is getting spilled from. So that's the difference between a clonal and a subclonal mutation. So pick 3 ca you can test any tissue or any even uh, ctDNA as long as there is ctDNA being spilled in the blood and you can capture that alteration. Hopefully that addresses that question. The second question was about six months um, of, of endocrine therapy and whether we would use that for six months of endocrine therapy. I think, again, an excellent question. Do we want to use antibody drug conjugates there? Do we want to rely on genomic information and try the triplet strategy? I think if we have a genomic alteration, I'd be open to trying it based on this data and applying that data to see. But I think it's an important scientific question whether the efficacy is going to be better with one approach or the other, and we need to understand that better. But today, I would try it. So, Hope, anything you want to add to that? And also, uh, let's take a look at this other question. This is one of the one things we had in this uh, post, the post that we're going to do for San Antonio, where we did not find a consensus. We should have probably narrowed the type of clinical scenario down. We maybe could have gotten a consensus. But again, the doubly mutated patient, endocrine-sensitive, uh, whether you go with capi fulvescent or alicestrant. Hope? Um, so I think it's a great question. And again, it's the narrowing down, I think, that really plays a big role here. In the other patient, it doesn't really matter because she progressed so rapidly, you know. But when you have a year and a half on treatment, that suggests you have endocrine-sensitive disease. Patient 65, what if they just had progression in a single site in bone or if they had progression in soft tissue. In that situation, I would consider an oral surge. You know, right now we have elicestrant to give. Um, and I think, you know, maybe in the future we'll be thinking about CDK after CDK with oral surge because that's being studied now. Uh, but if the patient has progression with new liver lesions um, or lung, et cetera, more symptomatic disease, then I would use capifulvestrant next. And I think what we don't know is you know, whether it's important to give fulvestrant here instead of an oral cert because you're going to see your best response to CAPI in that uh, setting. So let's finish out with some uh, cases very briefly uh, that you know, kind of relate to what we've been talking about here uh, today. Kamal, you have a 59-year-old woman. I love these cases where uh, patients uh, go on trials and then they end up being on the therapy for quite a while by the time it's actually approved, showing the potential advantage of going on trials. I think that applies to this lady. What happened with her? Yeah, no, I think this was this was a very classic patient that, uh, you know, would have been eligible for the Inava 120-like study, but she was actually enrolled on the phase one trial when we were trying to first see how this triplet might be uh, tolerated. Because as Hope pointed out, when we did those experiments with Alpalacib, we were not very successful. So in the phase one study, this patient, you know, would have fit the NAVO 120 study if that phase three was available then, but she was enrolled on our phase one trial. She actually did really well. I'd have to say, like, these women are really inspiring and really remarkable because, you know, we, we were talking to them about how lifestyle modifications are so much important. We definitely want uh, the hyperglycemia not to come in the way and, and diet and exercise and, and, you know, weight loss is, is so important. She really made a dramatic change in her lifestyle and, you know, changed her diet and changed her exercise routine. In fact, she was in the best shape of her life, as she called it, while she was on the phase one trial. She did extremely well. She, you know, continues to remain on study. I actually have a handful of patients still ongoing on my phase one trial with this triplet regimen, some even five years out that remain on trial. I have, I have a remarkable story of a woman from Brazil who comes in now from Brazil uh, and, and we, you know, treated her through the pandemic by sending her drug to Brazil, which was uh, really a remarkable story and remains NED on the triplet strategy. So I think, you know, this long term uh, tolerance that we're also seeing with this tri triplet is very reassuring. Hope, any comments on this case? Uh, no, I mean, I think it's, we see that. These are N of ones. You know, I know I had somebody on the phase 1B with alpelisib and fulvestrin as CR and liver and stayed on for four years. So we do see this. And I think it's great. But, uh, and, and again, you know, I, these patients who go on trials and then are still on the trial treatment with when there's approval, my other case here was on, uh, you know, 
Capi, uh, Capivaceratib trial, Capi 291, and is, was still on therapy until last week, you know, so really long time. Yeah. Yeah, I remember we did a video with a patient who was on the bispecific teclistamab for myeloma when I interviewed him and doing great and no symptoms and response. The day I entered, he'd been doing treatment for two years. The day we did the video was the day it was approved. So again, being on the trial was such an advantage. All right, let's finish out with this case from you, Hope. This lady presented 25 years ago at the age of 44. What happened? Yeah, she had an initial cancer at that time. We were just treating everybody with neoadjuvant chemo. Of course, now we have a little different approach, but she got AC times four, and then she had a little bit of cancer left, but three nodes, including a high level three node, got paclitaxel, tamoxifen radiation, was on letrozole, um, and finished 10 years of therapy. And then six years after finishing her letrozole, ended up with uh, extensive bone metastases. Um, there was a little red herring in there that she'd been in a hot tub and she got some kind of inflammatory pneumonia anyway. Um, so we biopsied her and she had ER positive disease. She went on letrozole and palbo 2016. That was the CDK we gave. And she stayed on that for five years. That was great. Um, got a little bit of radiation. But then she had progression of her disease and some increased pain. Um, and we did a GARDEN 360 that showed a PIK3CA mutation um, and increasing soft tissue. So the big question then was, you know, what do you do with this patient? She still has bone-only disease. We were able to biopsy it, show that ER positivity was maintained and a mutation. So she went on to, as uh, shown in the next slide, the uh, CAPI uh, trial, the phase three trial, but she was randomized to fulvestrin and cappy. It's always hard to blind when people get side effects that are specific. You know, she had a little diarrhea, a little rash, and um, uh, diarrhea very well managed, and the rash went away after two months. And she stayed on that now for almost four years and has a liver lesion. She just messaged today and said, do I have to really change treatment? <laughs> because you know, I've been on this for so long. And, you know, I think that's so amazing that we're able to keep patients on by targeting the tumor biology. Um, she's had a great response and has, has a single liver lesion, um, as shown in the uh, slide. You can see it's a really deep liver lesion next to her kidney, which I can't uh, can't biopsy, but you can also see that there was this big sacral lesion that on response had a really nice shrinkage and recovery of some of the, actually the bone uh, around the lesion and a resolution of her pain. So that was nice without radiation. So that was a great thing. And now she's going to go on a, another clinical trial with a oral cert. Yeah, that's the idea. Just keep people on clinical trials and uh, they're always going to be getting therapy a little bit earlier than everybody else. So I want to thank you both. Uh, what a great hour this has been uh, with you here today. Thanks, audience, for attending. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Kamal. Thank you so much, Hope. Have a thank great you. Night.